Right, we'll, we'll, we'll start the, uh, the meeting. Um, first of all, we've got... Oh, sorry. To it, it's, it's some slides that the mayor w w wanted to present, so that's the technical. Issue. We can start now, can we? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Right. <laughs> Uh, welcome to the uh, Economy, Business, Growth and Skills Over and Scrutiny Committee meeting. Um, apologies are from uh, Jim King, Stephen Homer and Daniel Meredith. Um, Daniel has rung up very, very recently to say his car's broken down. But I think he's going to get some, um, some leg pulling from Councillor Ray Dutton about this. <laughs> Jim Taylor and Sir Richard Lees. Um, I do thank, yet again, the substitute members who um, uh, you know, do so well for us in Councillor Stanton, Councillor uh, Dutton. Uh, and obviously, we've got the, here are the Mayor and the, the Chair of the LEP uh, and the League of Stockport Council, I think, who was not quite here yet um, in attendance. Now, I'm aware that the Mayor might need to leave uh, fairly early. Okay, good. So, so what, what we'll do after the declaration of interest, we'll, leave, we'll park the minutes and go straight into the, the session for, with the mayor. So, uh, are, there, are there any declaration of interest? Good, thank you. Well, uh, the next set, section then is the GMS implementation plan performance update, but also it, that will encompass, if you like, the mayor with a general update. And I believe you've got a few slides for us to see. Yeah. So, so the the floor is yours, sir. Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh you all for um, for your uh, for, for your time and your, your commitment so chair what I thought I would do in, in my kind of just opening remarks before we open up to questions is obviously brief you on some of what have been my top priorities in in my first uh, first term and I did want to share with you something that was presented to the Greater Manchester Reform Board last week um, which does demonstrate some genuine progress on things that we've identified as being uh, Greater Manchester priorities in the, um, in the Greater Manchester uh, strategy. It still seems to be um, on the way. Oh, there we are, right on cue. Well done, whoever uh, has helped uh, to, to do that. So um, I don't know if I can actually control the slides. Um, it won't take long on this, but I think it's important. You know, we talk about all these things. The question is, well, is anything really changing out there? You know, is what does devolution actually mean uh, in, in practical terms? So I thought I'd just quickly take you through some stuff that uh, has kind of been brought to our attention recently. So school readiness is a very big priority in the, uh, in the Greater Manchester strategy. All 10 boroughs have been focused on this, to be honest, long before devolution. And I'm very much aware of that. This has been a priority for Greater Manchester since sure start and the focus on on early years um, but we've tried to kind of get it really focused on that interface between early years and schools um, through the work we've done at the reform board and I think this figure um, these figures and this graph uh, tell a really powerful story I think for uh, Greater Manchester um, which shows that um, overall we are not yet at England average so I wouldn't want to overclaim but uh, the big improvement that uh, we've achieved is for children on free school meals. And now we've actually caught up uh, to the England average when it comes to the level of development for children on uh, free school uh, meals. And that is significant. And it shows us that some of our policies are getting exactly to the children that they need to, uh, need to reach. So you know, that was a new figure that we had. And we just thought that would be of interest to you. 
Now, this is an issue, of course, that um, you know, we all will deal with in our working lives pretty much every day now. It just seems to come back, doesn't it, in every conversation that's had at, at local level, the pressure on young people, concerns around their um, uh, mental well-being. So what you will see there, 45.8% with a diagnosable mental health condition would have received treatment compared to uh, 35% uh, nationally. We think this is in part down to the decision we took to become the first place in the country to publish uh, waiting time data for children's mental health. And I, st I think we're still the only place doing it. I'd have to check that, but I think, uh, I think we are. And these figures, um, well, it's, it's important not to, to sort of um, pat ourselves on the back too much because it's still what, far too long, isn't it, for, for, for children in this position. Uh, who, can, who can feel it's a great cause for celebration the average wait is almost seven weeks. It's not, not fantastic at all, is it? But it is quite a lot better than, than other places. Um, but there's improvement here. And it, it does come from the decision of the um, Devolved Partnership to um, prioritise children and young people's mental health when there was new funding available a couple of years ago and a significant uplift went in uh, to services at that point, and I, and I think you can see the, the results of, of that here, alongside initiatives like mentally healthy schools and, and other things. Uh, sport is the lifeblood of every community represented around this table, and I think it's the easiest and cheapest way to pretty much all of the objectives outlined in the, um, in the Greater Manchester strategy. You know, whatever it is that you're trying to achieve, if people are physically active, I think the evidence is that they're more likely to be able to move towards work or more likely to be um, uh, living a, a better life, have more well, well, mental health well-being. Um, so this figure um, represents um, the highest level ever of, num of adults physically active in, in Greater Manchester. But the rate of increase that we've achieved is three times the England average. So on the latest stats, we were up by 1.5%, which doesn't sound a great deal, but the national increase was 0.5%. So uh, I think there's something really powerful here. Uh, and I think GM moving greater sport have, have, have done a really good job. But I think it's also the extent to which the boroughs, everyone has physical activity and sport pretty much at the heart of that place-based uh, vision. And um, you know, it's working. Uh, and I think we should do more of it. I remember the uh, time when I was culture secretary and free swimming for under 16s, over 60s came about, and some of some of our council in Manchester are still trying to uh, trying to do it. I think the evidence is that things like that really work, um, combating loneliness amongst older people. So this is something to to be proud of. Uh, oh, what's happened there? And obviously, I, and here I'll go into sort of my more personal priorities, which the um, committee will be uh, aware of, Chair, in terms of um, progress on things that I said I wanted to, to, to prioritise. Now, you know, there's a lot to be said. People can see the, the figures on this, um, on, on this graph. The, the, the key one, I think, is the one in the second column, which is that on the latest counts that districts are doing under the um, conditions of the Rough Sleepers Initiative grant that's given by government, um, the level of rough, rough sleeping and the number of people sleeping rough has dropped below 200, um, which, if it's confirmed by the official count later this year, would, um, would represent quite a significant drop. Um, of, of course, homelessness is a much bigger issue than rough sleeping. Um, but the commitment we've given is to do more for those in the most desperate position, which is through a bed every night to, um, to support them. So this has been a constant figure really now, 350 people in the bed every night shelters. I want to thank you, through you, your boroughs, for ev the support they've given us has been magnificent, to be honest. The number of people who are working hard to make a bed every night work in all 10 districts is just fantastic. Um, and as of last Friday, we had 400 and, well, I don't think they're all in place yet, but we're building up to having 401 places available over, over the coming winter. Health 
are now a partner, a funding partner in a bed every night. Um, so we're running it to the, we're funded to the middle of next year. Health are putting in two million pounds, uh, but also we want more health input in our shelters so that more mental health uh, provision can be available in the places where people are. Because I think the evidence I've kind of found is that kind of saying to people in a shelter, oh, and you can go to this GP practice who's agreed it doesn't really work. What works is if you're in the place and you can provide that full support where people are. So I, I just wanted to show colleagues these things because this is the delivery side of uh, things rather than just talking about the big ambitions. And there is, a, uh, I think, a, a, a um, uh, modest in some ways, but nevertheless tangible progress being made on some of the key priorities outlined in the Greater Manchester um, strategy. Uh, in terms of where it goes from here, so Bed Every Night is part of what we're doing on um, uh, homelessness, but we now have the government's uh, Housing First pilot fully up and running, and it's beginning to hit it, its stride. So the latest figures I had are that 80 people uh, across the 10 boroughs have been referred for Housing First support, and they may be some of the um, 195, by the way, so these are people often, Housing First is, is geared towards the people with the most complex uh, needs, many of whom will have been on the streets for the longest. Um, and of the 80 that have been referred, I think we're up to about 35 who've now been accommodated under, under Housing First. Uh, and you know, we're, we're saying, look, you know, with the winter coming, let's get those numbers moving quickly. The issue why, why it doesn't move more quickly is availability of appropriate uh, uh, housing, uh, but we're working with the GM housing providers to get the, the properties coming through to, to see if we can move those figures uh, further. So that was an update on uh, on homelessness. I'll just touch on two more things before opening up to questions, which were also uh, priorities that I think people might, might be interested in, in hearing a little more about. So young people uh, was another thing that I said I wanted to prioritise, and then transport more broadly. I'll just, just finish on that. With regard to young people, the uh, committee will know that the, the specific commitment to a free bus pass for 16 to 18s uh, was delivered at the start of uh, September. Uh, it's a pilot at this stage, so there is no long-term funding uh, agreement yet uh, for what we call our pass, but it is a reality now. It's a piece of plastic in the pockets of, at latest count, 34,431 young people uh, in Greater Manchester. Um, and that's out of an eligible cohort, we think, of 65,000. I don't know what the other 30,000 are doing, but I'm kind of happy that they've not necessarily applied because we budgeted for 46. So we've got a little bit of headroom here. Uh, TFGM, sort of on the basis of take up in other parts of the country, said that they thought 46 was a steady state number. I'm kind of encouraged that we're not, we're not uh, there, which kind of means we've got a bit of leeway. Um, they've made so far 2.2 million journeys, um, and it is working out at around two to three journeys a day. So they're obviously going to college and back with an odd journey here and there, possibly a weekend or that, that or an evening. That's how it seems to be uh, working out. What's really encouraging is um, how many people are also beginning to take up the opportunity side of the RPAS, not just the travel side. 238 have been to the Halle, uh, 126 to the Royal Exchange, 286 uh, to the Europa League game at Old Trafford, 177 to the Champions League at City, there's something in those figures, um, 486 to our Leisure Trust. I think one uh, went to Radcliffe Borough, God bless whoever that person uh, was. Yeah, one person, and I think five went to Kurz and Ashton for a game. So, yeah, there's everyone, all tastes uh, catered for. Um, but the R-Pass is, is, I think, um, I, I, you know, it's been introduced well by TFGM. And don't forget, you know, this is also about people using buses that wouldn't have been, shoring up some of those bus routes that may be at risk in your communities. Uh, bus operators have brought extra buses on, partly with our help, which is a bit frustrating, but they have, because you know there, there is a need to grow the fleet because of our pass. The way I look at this is, and I'm going to come on in a moment to um, the broader update on, on transport, 
whatever we decide to do on buses, you've got to get more people using buses again, and you have to particularly get the younger generation uh, back on back on the buses. So early evidence would suggest that our pass is beginning to achieve that. Just more broadly on young people, Chair, the other commitment I made was to a UCAS style system for apprenticeships uh, in Greater Manchester. And the skills team here have been doing a lot of work on that. The way I look at it is obviously young people on the university route are very well catered for and they know exactly what's required of them. They know what to do to, to get where they need to go. That's not the case uh, for young people requiring uh, technical qualifications, apprenticeships, or routes into work. It's much more confusing for them. So the system we've been creating um, is intended to correct that. It will be called GMAX, Greater Manchester Apprenticeships and Career Service. Um, and effectively, it's trying to give that simple message to our young people, UCAS, GMAX, you know, two routes. And on this single portal will be work shadowing, um, careers advice, um, but also real apprenticeships. And what it's trying to correct here is, you know, them getting bad advice in schools about what things might be available, and they start to make choices at school that are linked to real opportunities in the greater Manchester economy. So they get what I've always described as a line of sight from where they are in their life to an opportunity that they can see out there that, that is something that they can realistically work towards. And often it's the lack of that that I think leads to young people not having a sense of hope at school or kind of feeling uh, a bit lost or not knowing what they want to do after school. So that will come through uh, early in the new year as a what's called a minimum viable product, a very a basic service to begin with. But it, it, its functionality will be able to grow over the years and the numbers of opportunities it includes will, will increase. And you know we would obviously be looking to the districts to really help us get schools using it, get young people using it, and I think it's, a, it's an exciting development. So then, very finally, on transport, um, colleagues will be familiar with the R Network vision that we've, that we've put out. Um, and in short, that's a, a vision for a London-style transport system uh, over, a, over a decade, and hopefully before, where you have all of the modes of transport integrating to allow convenient, reliable, and crucially affordable journeys and actually allows the Greater Manchester public to, to, to commute differently to the way they do now because the way the current system works is that it, it traps people on one mode because it makes them, you know, they can't, if you get off one mode and jump on another, you're paying as a new customer on that and it's not the London system that looks at all of your journeys and then caps them within a, an integrated uh, system. So I think if we're to kind of get the place moving as it needs to, we've got to get to a position where public transport is a much more convenient and affordable option uh, than it currently uh, currently is. Um, so, you know, we, we have moved forward with the consultation on bus uh, reform and the TFGM recommendation that we move to a franchising uh, system that will close early in the new year. I very much see, whatever the decision on bus reform, I believe it's a realistic ambition for Greater Manchester to look at a London-style system over bus and tram within, I would hope, uh, a window of three to four years, hopefully closer to the earlier part of that. So what that means to me is a, a, a system that allows integrated ticketing across both of those modes. And again, in a reform system, however you do it, um, through the, the partnership route or franchising route, whichever one is the one that's, that's decided under the, the legislation, that you would start to be able to use more orbital bus connections to deliver people to Metrolink so that then they can sort of make those sort of those journeys. At the moment, the way the bus system works, it tends to follow Metrolink as the spokes into the centre and it doesn't deliver the, the passengers necessarily to those convenient places when they can, um, can jump from one mode to another. So our network is, is the guiding vision and um, the... Um, uh, Head of the GMCA, as you see, has just walked in, Eamon Boylan. Uh, we both said to TFGM every time we speak now that, that everything it's doing should be contributory to the delivery of the R network vision. Um, and if it isn't contributory, then actually we need to question why are we doing it? You know, and that goes to Chris Boardman's work as well. We're talking of a bike hire scheme that we hope to sort of start to bring through at some point in 2020. 
that, I hope, will in the end be in the contactless integrated system. So you might use a bike for your first or your last mile to get on a, a reformed bus, to get on a tram. You know, this, this is how this system needs to work, where it's, it's built as a, everything that we're doing now, every bit of the TFGM system needs to be thinking about how will this knit into our network and how will this help people uh, move differently across uh, Greater Manchester. So apologies for taking up some time, Chair, but there's obviously a lot to update colleagues on then. Uh, more than happy to answer questions on things I've mentioned, but whatever's in the Greater Manchester strategy that people are interested in that I've not mentioned also on any of that. So thank you. Um, thank you for that very interesting um, update. And clearly a, a lot of positive progress is taking place. Before I throw out, out four questions, I've got one thing I want to ask you myself, which is a general thing. But when you ask questions, can I just remind you, first of all, in terms of the strategy, whilst you, you can ask any question the mayor you like, you know, on the strategy set, we should focus on items, priorities two, three, and four, which, you want, which is our remit. And secondly, can I all remind you, we're in Perda. So you, know, you need to be careful as to what questions you do ask. And I'm sure that our, the officers will say if any question can't be asked. But hopefully there won't be any such, because you're, you're all well-experienced people. My question, actually, was you, you focus on all the positives, and there are a lot of good positives. What are the biggest disappointments in terms of, of uh, the last six months? The obvious question. Oh, what a question, Chair. That's a, that's a mean one. Um, I think, okay, so I'll, 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 you know, I'll answer it as honestly as I can. I think the process of making change is harder, I think, than I, than I thought um, in the complexity of the GM model, if I, if I can just put it this way. You know, it's a harder car to drive than I thought it was when I came in, in that you don't just move the gear stick and everything moves in the, do you know what I mean? It's, it's. And maybe that reflects where devolution is, is up to. Um, that we're kind of, yes, we're making progress, but it's still sort of work in progress, if I could put it that way. Um, and the way in which, you know, we, we kind of work together, districts to GM, I think that, that can constantly be, be improved, uh, I think. So where, where, would, where would I see the biggest disappointments, if you like, in terms of um, progress? I mean, I, I, I do find the transport chaos really disappointing at times and it is chaos on the railways and it can be on the roads um, some some evenings um, and, and I think just getting getting a, a grip on that I find frustrating I, I, I don't um, kind of feel I've moved it as far as I, I, I would have liked to the the really frustrating bit is obviously when you create a mayor the public thinks you've got all of these levers and they expect you just to be pulling them and and obviously it's not quite like that. So in many ways people are kind of screaming rightly for change and they're coming directly to me and yet I can't necessarily uh, answer things to their satisfaction. I think the Northern Rail situation I think would be the, the prime example, uh, the prime example of that. But that said, you know, I, I'm, I'm, as you say, I'm not a candidate at the general election. I'm just thinking about your Perda comments. So I'm not hankering after leaving and going back there. So I'm you know, relishing this role uh, in many ways, I'm kind of encouraged by some of the progress which I've shown you uh, this morning. Um, but uh, I think there are things where we can improve um, in terms of delivery. And I think I'm very now focused on delivery. The strategy is good. The words are good. The visions are good. I don't think it's a case of them being weak. Or, you know, we've got powerful visions. The issue that worries me more now is, is the delivery clearly in place between the GM level and the districts? to turn this into proper progress in people's lives and differences in their, in their communities. And um, I, I, I don't think I can say to you honestly yet that I think we're where we need to be on, on that. Just to ask, ask one little rider to that, and you mentioned which is my, my concern in a way, in terms of uh, the relationship you've got with, with the, the ten authorities. Is that working as well? I know I don't want specific examples for obvious reasons. Is that working as well as you think it can be, or is there a long way to go to improve that relationship? Um, I think it's it's a bit like a marriage, isn't it? I think you you can't always say it's in a perfect state, can you? And you have to work at it, don't you? And um, I think that will always be the case, won't it? In our in our model, in the London model, 
the GLA is not the councils, it's a free freestanding elected uh, body. Um, but I, I, and in some ways that might sound a little easier, but I'd rather have our model because I think it's a stronger, more coherent model if everyone can agree to move in the same. And it is about a shared endeavour, isn't it? It's not about me telling people what to do. It's about are we going to agree, all of us amongst ourselves, to move in this direction? And that needs constant working at, I think. If you were to ask me to identify the single biggest tension uh, in our model, it's the sense of whether or not there's equity in terms of attention from here across all 10. <coughs> and you know, is it often natural that the city centre dominates people's attention or the airport? Or media, and, and, and there's not a sort of... Um, and I think, to be truthful, that's something that needs to be worked on. And I felt that as a as a member of parliament for Lee. I mean, I, you know, I, I would ask that same question. So I don't think it's a new question at all, but I think it's, as the city centre really does sort of power ahead, you know, I think it's a question that is asked a little more. You know, what's the benefit for the, let's say the eight boroughs you know, or nine boroughs of Greater Manchester devolution? And I think, you know, it's, it's incumbent on me and Eamon possibly to demonstrate to the nine boroughs why it's worth being part of this thing called Greater Manchester Devolution. I think the Stockport Mayoral Development Corporation is, is something I hope that um, other boroughs will look at, because I am ready to intervene in that kind of way if, if other districts felt it would be helpful, where we can bring the powers that are given to us to drive regeneration. And I'm you know, interested to see how Rochdale Town Centre is moving, Bolton, I think there are plans I think the next phase of Greater Manchester won't be that the, the city centre's got the momentum that it needs in some ways in terms of the attention that's been given. I think the next 20 years here will be about the revival of our outlying towns, actually, and, and how they connect to this reinvigorated regional centre. So it's, that, I think, is at the heart of the relationship between the councils and here. Um, you know, can we really sort of make devolution real in each of those boroughs so that you know we can see what value it's adding to the to the work of the council and um yeah i i, I hold my hands up and say there's there's more to be done there thank you your honesty questions uh greg yep and then and then um susan thank you chair um we, this morning, Andy, I had a briefing with some people who I think are from your team about some of the bus uh, reform, and they were quite clear on a lot of the uh, upfront costs involved in the, the transformation of the network, and uh, I comprehended and understood all of that, and I'm broadly speaking supportive of it. What they were perhaps a little bit less clear on, and what my question would be about, is perhaps some of the revenue subsidy that is required after that transformation is, is complete. Can you sort of, you, you did mention at the last meeting that you and I were at, which was one of these, but I can't remember which one, that you had been talking with central government about an increased or bringing on some sort of subsidy. Can you update us for any granularity on that? Because my concern is that if we don't have that in place, we might spend uh, a lot of taxpayer money transforming a network that doesn't necessarily then offer anything more than it did in the first instance if we don't have the revenue to guarantee some of the less well-used bus routes or to bring about the behavioural change that will be required to take people onto the buses. Otherwise, we just provide the same services as that we did before to the same group of people that we did before, but at a slightly higher cost to the taxpayer than before. Well, it's an excellent question, and it's something that worries me a little, um, because there is the cost of reforming the system is, is one thing and the TFGM assessment sets that out 134 million I think I'm, I'm right in saying um, oh well, I stand corrected <laughs> <laughs> okay oh, it's coming down which is good obviously Eamon's working some magic on those uh, figures um, so then there is the issue of the running of a reform system however it is reformed and I agree with you, you know, it's such a, you know, a sort of um, astute question because if it's not different in feel and quality, then people will ask big questions about what did you spend that 134 or 26 million for? Um, but I suppose two answers to your question. Number one, we're not comparing apples with apples because in a, in a reform system, it won't be the same. Because you, if you can sort of link it with Metrolink and you, 
which is even if there's not as, still not many buses running, but you can link the, the buses that are running more to key transport nodes so that people then can make sort of integrated journeys using both. Do you see what I mean? You, you, you can kind of, because you can target the use of the bus routes more, you might get more out of the services that are running. That would be one answer I would give. The, the second answer about the level of subsidy, I think it is, it's going to be a case of sort of the more you get, the more you'll be able to sort of improve things. But st or if you don't get it, you'll just have to, you know, you, you know what I mean? You'll have to cut your cloth ac accordingly. Um, so the, the latest is that um, the government, when they came here for their conference uh, in um, late September, early October, issued a document that made a specific commitment to provide revenue subsidy to areas reforming buses. And then they referenced Greater Manchester as being recognised as being very much at the front of that of that um, uh, that, that process. Um, it hasn't turned into yet sort of pound coins in Eamon's coffers, um, but um, I, I remain hopeful that a statement of that kind can't be you know wouldn't be made unless there was real intent. And I think in the spending review, to the extent that the, there was a one-year spending review earlier this year, so there is some funding in a heading for bus subsidy that is sitting there for 1920-21. So the government have started to build up a fund anticipating, I think, that there will be a call for, for revenue subsidy from, from cities like ours. So it hasn't turned into a, a, a precise figure. It, to give you one, I would say minimum £30 million is what we should be asking for. Um, so that this isn't done all on the backs of council taxpayers. If that's where we get to with bus reform, well, it would be unfair because it would be the, the old story. London had subsidies when they were reforming their buses, but we're meant to do it all from council tax. Well, that doesn't feel, feel right to me. So I think what's good, Chair, is the cross-party way in which we've mounted this campaign. And actually the manifesto for the North, which you may have seen come out in the last couple of days, makes reference um, to revenue subsidy for... Uh, not just talking about HS2 and all the big things, it's saying that the government's commitment to the North on transport should include help with the daily running of basic services. So the answer, Greg, to your question is it's in a pretty good place, but it hasn't translated yet into bankable support so that we can plan for the reform, running of a reform system. I hope that will be clarified shortly after uh, a general election. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, so in priority three, um, we've got uh, a figure I've calculated out to be around 27.3% of Greater Manchester residents uh, have um, skills levels below level two. And of course, you know, uh, that's highlighted as something that, that is uh, one of the priorities in the programme. And I just want to get a, a sense if, if there's any understanding, and perhaps it links to the, uh, the bus pass, that, um, that, that obviously we've got working age adults, but we've got the young people, and it seems that young people is an area to focus on for this. It, you know, uh, it can be slightly harder to start upskilling people who are in work, although it is identified in the programme that that is something that's happening. But young people, sure, you know, to get their skills levels up seems the big thing to do. So I want to get a sense of, um, is, is it to do that, is it... Uh, and from the evidence base, really, you know, that you work with the officers on. Um, does the evidence base tell us that still, really, what the local colleges are? For, so if you've got a young person living in Bolton, it really is going to be about the local colleges, say, in Bolton, that, that, are going to, that is going to be a large, uh, make a large difference to that? Or is it, is it, uh, is it what is in, uh, on offer in the city as well? Because if they've a bus pass, you know, they would be very attracted, would they not? Mm -hmm to um, Manchester, Salford, and so on. I mean, but this is me guessing. I'm trying to get a sense of the evidence base and, uh, you know, and what, what obstacles there might be. I'm interested in what obstacles there might be, particularly for the young people, to, uh, to you to... I mean, do we have enough college places? Um, so that w what are the obstacles and ca are we overcoming them to really drive the, the skills up? Uh, uh, the offer, really, for, for, for them, for, for young people, so that they can have even better lives than, than those that have gone before them. 
Thank you very much, Sue. A big, a big part of the RPAS, the thinking behind it, was what you've just said, which is to say to young people, don't limit your choices beyond school by what you feel you can afford. You know, it's, it's a case of saying to them, look, you can, there are some amazing colleges um, across our ten boroughs, and basically all of them are essentially there, there for you. Um, and um, you know that was the intention of it, and I think there's evidence that some people are are doing that. You know, there's Win Stanley in our part of the world is very well regarded, and I think that is more, you know people are travelling some distance to get to Win Stanley College. Same with Loretto here, you know, and, and we could all think of colleges in, in in our in our boroughs, and I think there is evidence that the R Pass has done a bit of that. I also heard I picked up last week via my brother, who is a uh, principal of a 6-1 college uh, in Preston, that some of the colleges on the fringes of Greater Manchester are losing students because our students are deciding to stay within Greater Manchester now because our pass covers them fully, whereas if they were going out of the, of the area, then obviously they wouldn't get their travel costs covered. So I think our GM colleges are benefiting. I think there's no limit to the places. I think they've got plenty of places. Um, I think there's a a recognised weakness on level four qualifications uh, in some of our colleges, and I think there's a, an effort to, to drive that up, linked to the Greater Manchester Industrial Strategy. So, you know, where we've got these priority sectors, getting our colleges a little bit more focused with the universities on those key sectors that we're going to be building up um, in, the, um, in the coming years. Th this system that we're bringing through, this GMAC system that I mentioned, um, is really about connecting the means to travel with the what destination you know so if you've got a year 10 and they can see all of these opportunities in the city I don't think they know you know from your part of the world in Bolton I don't think they know the breadth of what is available here and the salaries that they could earn and the I, 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 best one in the world I'm not blaming their teachers or their parents but I, I don't think I know you know the full range of careers that are available in a thriving digital and, and tech economy um, and it's about giving them that line of sight. So when they know what's out there and they know they can travel, it's about lifting those, those horizons. And that's what these policies are, in, are intended to do. Just on the adult point, it's an important one, Chair. I don't know whether the committee needs to take a look at this in more detail if you haven't already. The adult education budget is now under our, uh, our control. £92 million. It's a significant amount of money. And... I think this is a stone that Whitehall hadn't turned up for years. It was just kind of being you know, rolled over. Grants that have been given for years to a range of organisations just being rolled over, rolled over, and quite randomly spent, I have to say. I, I think it might be worth the committee taking a look at it and seeing how the adult education budget is, is being used, because there's a huge opportunity there to link it more strategically to our growth industries, so that... You can provide conversion courses for adults to move to the new economy, the digital economy, and, and other, the green economy, whatever it might be. And I think adult education has not been used strategically at all uh, in, in the past. And there's 92 millions of million pounds there that could be used in a much more effective way. But I think it might help if you as a committee look at it and you know, consistent with your remit to, to try and really link that to the, um, the GM economy. Uh, we've already looked at that to a level, actually. It's, okay. we, 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 we've had papers in the, in, in the past looking at the allocation of, of what's been done. Yeah. Whether we need to do more on it is a, 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 an interesting thing to think about, perhaps. Okay. Uh, th th thank you. Thank you, Chair. Can I ask a bit of a technical question? I hope you don't mind. Um, Simon, on priority three, there's that table of medium pay changes. And unfortunately... Wigan, Bolton, Oldham are not doing as well as the other seven when you look at the improvements on the medium pay. But I want to get a sense, if you know anything about the data, is it, is it though, that, that the medium pay increases are, uh, are there more because of, say, the uplift on perhaps the professional pay jobs? I know that there's a separate indicator in Priority 4 around living wage target, and that's quite set out very well, but... I just wanted to get a sense on median pay, whether it's uh, that, that improvements there, whether that's known more to be around the professional pay jobs at the moment. 
Can you just add to that? That's one of my concerns, actually, that's that there's lots of, of, of great jobs, opportunities created across the, the conurbation, but not necessarily, you know, equally. It can never be equal, but, it, but, but there's a disproportionate, if you like, concentration in certain areas compared to places like Bolton and places like Rochdale. I think you're saying something slightly different, Chair. I was just asking for factual information because yeah, I, I might not be concerned if it, if, it, if it were people who were, you know, uh, doing, improving their lives who've actually, you know, first generation of people who've got qualifications. Thank you. Uh, Susan, the, the short answer is I, I would have to look back at the because it, it, it'll vary from district to district about why the why the numbers are changing. Um, so we we can do some digging into that for you and come and come back to you. But uh, it, it is a it, it'll be a, it'll be a mixture of things. Obviously, the, the employment rates are at a at an all time high, so you have got more people in work, and that will therefore yeah. improve median uh, employment rates. But there will also be a, a kind of professional uh, uh, impact in there as well. But, and I suspect, and without knowing the data. In detail, I suspect it's a mixture of both, but the combination of the word both is very different, I suspect, in, in different districts. So I'll, I'll do some digging and see what level of breakdown we can get on that data. If I may, Chair, very briefly, in answer to both of you, actually. Um, Susan, just to, to, because it's relevant to your question, the Greater Manchester Good Employment Charter opens formally for applications in January, I think. So this will be for people who've expressed an interest to apply to become members of it and obviously the living wage is, an, is a strand of what membership requires and I think it will be for districts really to try and drive you know, drive support to, for this but also for us all maybe to amend our procurement policies for the weighted social value uh, side of things to then say well you know if, if, if you're awarding contracts GM recognised good employers will get a weighting in the in the assessment. So I think if GM's collective procurement comes behind uh, that, then I think you could move potentially wage levels in some of our boroughs over over a medium term sort of horizon. Uh, and that's something that we would be keen to work with you on. But but chair, you're right too. You know that we need a better spread of the best quality jobs, don't we? And you know, I know it's not popular. I'll mention it, the Great Manchester Spatial Framework. It's why the Northern Gateway is very important, because it's about a big strategic site that could be used for advanced manufacturing, the commercialization of graphene, um, I, I, any of those things. Um, and so, you know, it's our biggest site, I think, Eamon, by some considerable margin. And it's, I think, yeah, yeah. <laughs> A country mile. Um, I don't think there's a will here to let that go for warehousing, or you know, I, I think there's a there's a. I mean, Mike maybe could say more about this. The will is to see if we can get the best quality jobs that we can, and that would obviously benefit Berry, Rochdale, and Oldham residents. Michael. Yeah. Thank you. Um, interested to hear about your bike hire scheme. Presumably, they'll be Burnham's bikes. Uh, once they uh, once they come on, <laughs> um, in terms of you've highlighted the hour pass uh, and some of the benefits from that, and obviously it's in the pilot stage at the moment. So, in terms of obviously that's built up an expectation now amongst young people and those people that are going to be qualifying in future. Um, do you expect that to be turned into a commitment going forward once you've evalu evaluated the pilot and you know and all the assessments been done on it? And I noticed you mentioned about you didn't obviously there's no long term funding in there. So how would you expect that to be funded, sort of like going forward, um, if it does become a sort of like a, a permanent uh, a permanent scheme? Thanks, uh, th thanks very much, Michael. I mean, yeah, it's a it, it's a challenge. You know, it always was a challenging thing to fund something like this, as, as, as you know. But I, I remain passionate that this is the right thing to do, particularly for Wigan kids, who I know very well and know you know very well. You know, opening up Greater Manchester to them is something that we should do morally, in, in my view. You know, cost of bus travel to them compared to kids of the same age in London is just, you know, it's, it's just wrong that they are held back in their life by something as simple as the cost of, cost of bus fares. So to answer your question, on the figures that I quoted before, um, both in terms of the numbers of RPAS holders and the usage of the RPAS, 
that would suggest that the figures are within the budget uh, that was set out for uh, this two-year pilot, because it is a, that's, ba that's the base on which it's going forward at the moment. Um, I mentioned figures about pupil, uh, student retention in GM. I think it has had a financial benefit for our colleges. I mean, it might differ from one to another, but, and it might be modest, but there is a benefit. We are asking them to contribute, because many of them did purchase bus passes for individual students before, and we're trying to collectivise that money as part of a contribution to the RPAS scheme, and we have an agreement with the FE colleges and, and with six forms as well. So the pilot is intended, obviously, to, on the one level to um, identify stable levels of take-up and usage, but on another, it's intended to sort of look at what, um, what we can get as a contribution uh, from, uh, from uh, the sector as well. Um, we, we, we aren't just talking about uh, public funding. Uh, you'll notice that we've got uh, JD, who are a, a main sponsor of the scheme, and they've put a significant amount of funding in to support this project so, so far. Um, so it, the pilot is intended to see if we can find a sustainable base for, um, for it. In the long run, if Greater Manchester were to go down a, a franchise scheme or if, or if a, a reformed partnership option were to emerge, it would be to pick up the costs of it within, within that system. Uh, I met a bus operator this week who said to me that they see absolutely the logic of it and actually they want to convert the 18-year-olds into 19-year-olds. You know, so what could they do to retain these kids? Is there another offer that they could make to keep them from 18 to 21 and you know so I think the commercial incentive will pick this up at some point you know um, so all of this stuff needs to be needs to be thought uh, thought through but I think you know the fact that more people are using buses in any if franchise if the TFGM option is to be the one that, that is accepted and I say if because it's an open consultation there's a decision to be made but if that were the case, it's not a retractive option to franchise a declining market. And bus patronage has been declining here since the 1980s. And I think w whatever we decide to do with the buses, you have to turn that around and you have to get the line going back up again. You, you're much better to reform a rising market than you are a declining market. And I think the R Pass is a first big intervention into the market to try and move the figures in the, in the right direction. It, the, the big answer is, I guess, you know, there's a mayoral election coming up. There's manifestos to be produced. Candidates will have to say maybe what they think about this thing and whether they would commit to it or not. And um, you know, I, I fully expect to be challenged on the, on the hustings about that. And um, obviously, we'll be thinking carefully about my answer in the, in the coming few weeks. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I was, I was also going to ask about the median income figures as well, because obviously the headline figure is um, so, you know positive. It's got a great, it's um, kind of looks good, but obviously when you deep uh, dig down, it's kind of part of the point of devolution is about trying to address the north-south divide that we've got. But we're also possibly seeing kind of one emerging in Greater Manchester. So it's about trying to what what kind of work's been done to readdress that. I think that's already kind of been answered. And my other question was going to be, uh, is about the, um, I noticed when you're talking about our network, that um, rail devolution kind of wasn't really mentioned. So I'm just wondering what kind of progress you can report on that. Yes. I think that was the first one, oh, the median earnings side of things, was that, is that, is that okay in terms of what we said around the good yeah. employment job? Yeah. Well, on rail devolution, um, I, I, I think there's a lot of progress there. Um, I think the rail debate, although it's frustrating, has moved on considerably from where it was this time uh, last year. Um, we await the Williams review. I don't know whether Eamon knows more than me, but it's, it's, it's probably would have been out by now if it hadn't been for the general election, or it was imminent, wasn't it? And, um, uh, or was it? Uh, yeah. 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 But... I think there's been broad acceptance now of a devolved um, element to ra the, the rail system. Um, and the question is working out the details now. You know, we had a, a commitment from the Prime Minister at the Convention of the North about it. 
Um, so as far as we're concerned, you know, this is a committed uh, policy now, and we need to turn it into um, into something that's going to work for us. So the, the question will come, well, what's the scope of a reformed rail system? Where do GM commuter services sort of, you know, where would you say is a sort of reasonable, you know, there are pan-northern services, but there are those that originate much closer to us here. What would be our relationship with those neighbouring authorities outside of GM who are covered by those services and we need to would need to work up an arrangement with them? What's the scope for tram train? Uh, you know, so almost integrating the commuter rail system with Metrolink. I think that's a very big opportunity uh, for us. So these things, we've almost got a principal commitment to it. Um, and I think we, you know, the, the, the election has probably taken made it go quiet for a, for, a, for a month or two, but I think it is absolutely, as far as we're concerned, a committed direction of, of travel. TFGM has published its rail prospectus. I don't know if you've seen that, but that was published um, uh, early last month. Uh, and I think that's a you know, positive vision for how rail fits in. Um, in my head, and this might be kind of me just talking off the top of it, but I'll, I hope it's not, um, I see this... So we've got a Metrolink system now, which is, you know, going to extend early in the new year to Trafford Park. And it's pretty good. Well, it's not without its faults, but it's pretty good. So on top of that, the first stage of one will be buses. And as I was saying before, that you're looking at a three to four year timetable there, but hopefully th three. And I want it to be as quick as possible, the reformed bus system. And then I think you're looking at a more, let's say, five to seven year horizon for how reformed devolved rail might then come in and, and knit into that, that system. Alongside all of that, you've got the B network and the, the, the rollout of bike hire. Um, so that's the kind of broad time frame that I'm, I'm thinking. You know, within, a, within a decade, you would want to see a, a London-style uh, system. And, and it's really important to say, I don't necessarily see um, rail devolution as being but us just running the existing stuff with different sort of livery, uh, you know, GM rail on what are today the northern trains. There might be a bit of that. What I do see is much greater opportunity for turning the rail network yellow, as TFGM say, making it more Metrolink. Um, you know, that's what we did when we extended Metrolink to Oldham and Rochdale. And the figures are that that line carried one million passengers a year as a heavy rail service with a big public subsidy. And today, as Metrolink carries six million passengers a year with no public subsidy, so I think that tells you something about the way the rail industry is just not convenient and attractive enough for a lot of people. You know, if you if you make it more a Metrolink-style service, I think you open it up to a lot more a lot more people. So that's the broad way in which I see this the sequencing of this working. Thank you, Chair. Um, First of all, I welcome your report, Andy. I think it's, uh, it shows warts and all. I mean, you, you've already accepted things could be better in certain little bits and bobs. But what I do welcome the most on there is the recognition of uh, mental illness within children. This used to be a taboo subject this 10 year ago, never discussed, and children were put in the mission huts, so to speak, who had problems. Uh, I had the pleasure a couple of weeks back to go around Birch, Birch Hill Hospital, Hospital in Rochdale, uh, and I saw the good work they were doing. Uh, and what came out of that meeting really from me was um, the link with poor attendance in schools so we can improve the actual mental health of our children. That then improves the attendance in the schools. And if you get it early enough, you'll reduce the amount of children that are in our special needs schools. And I recognise that. I'm a chair of governors of a special needs school. Uh, and I see the type of child over the last 30 years I've been involved. I've seen the change in our children. And it's more and more now becoming more mental health problems. Uh, and we are now starting to recognise that. So I really do welcome that. The problem we've still got, though, is we've still got a lack of the professionals who can diagnose and get to these children earlier. And then perhaps your, your statistics will be improved tenfold, even better what you've already done. So I do welcome this report. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ray. Um, I think you're right about the um, severity of this issue now. It's, 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 it, the, the, the need much outstrips the, the supply of support, doesn't it? And though the waiting time figures are better than the England average, you, you don't 
want a child with a diagnosable mental health condition to be waiting seven weeks for, for help. And it's still the case that sometimes they're going out of GM to get, I think I'm right in saying that, you know, some distance to get the help that they, uh, that they need. There's, the, the shocking statistic is we, we had a presentation in this room last week at the Reform Board about health and justice and increasing the joint working between the criminal justice system and health. If you look at the youth um, justice system, it's still the case that seven out of ten young people in the criminal justice system, young offenders, have a an undiagnosed or untreated mental health problem, which actually is a, is a shameful statistic, shameful. Because basically the kids you're talking about drop through, yeah. no one picks them up, and you know they are some of the kids who are living the toughest lives, aren't they? And, and there's just sometimes nothing down for them, and, and they end up in, and that just you know just so so wrong. So in terms of a policy response, mentally healthy schools has been something that the um, Health Partnership have championed. I think it's in about 60 schools in GM now. Uh, this is independent counselling based within the school. Organisations like 42nd Street have been providing it. And it, it's, I think, been pretty successful. So the idea of even having a mental health service in a school was a, would have been taboo, as you say, going back a few years. But now it's... And that's such a big piece of progress, I think. Turning more to like your, kind of, your point about getting more targeted help for those who most need it, I'm really keen that we firm up in the new year a, a care leavers guarantee. Because if you think about those most vulnerable, I think it's that group who are most at risk of poor mental health, um, slipping through the system, on leaving care, ending up, you know, at risk of, of all kinds of challenges. Uh, and I think, you know, we, we should be um, thinking about how do we here create a much stronger safety net, particularly for those groups that we can identify are most likely to have mental health needs or be at risk of... Um, uh, of um, challenges or risk of falling into the criminal justice system, wh whatever it might be. So I, I, I'm very much focused on that, and I think we need to up our game a little bit there in terms of better support for those. You, know, you could have young carers in that group. You could, you know, it's not hard to work out which kids in schools are going to be carrying around the biggest burden on their shoulders, is it? It's not difficult, is it? I think we can find out. We think we know who they probably will be. So the question is, identify them and then come up with a better package of support for them. Well, thank you, Mayor, for your... Oh, one more. Yes. I'll, I'll, we'll make this the last one because, you know, we, we had the Mayor for an hour yes. and also we've got other things to come through with two more presentations, so we'll make this the last question. OK, well, mine wasn't going to be a question, but mine was actually going to be a comment, and it's about... Is that OK, Chair? Perfect. Um, my comment is, is what a wonderful time to be here in Greater Manchester and all of the exciting things that's coming forward. We've waited a long time to be able to have this. And so can I just say thank you very much to everybody for actually working together, not just in silos anymore, and that we're working as a combined authority for the, be for the better and to actually help more people in Greater Manchester. So thank you very much, Andy, for all the hard work you've been doing and the teams that's been going forward. Looking forward to seeing the next generation coming forward, better skilled, better equipped to be able to get those good jobs that we're having here. Thank you. Oh, I'm going to grab that bouquet and uh, <laughs> hold, it, hold it tight and I'm uh, going to carry it uh, home with me this weekend. And, uh, but, yeah, every, it's not perfect. And as I was saying, you know, there are things where... You know, there are frustrations, but I think there's something really, really significant growing here. If I can just make a final comment, Chair. I'm not going to get into the general election, but what I will say is, knowing that world as I do, the, the, the levels of dysfunction that we've seen recently, I don't think they're going away anytime soon in that, you know, Parliament is struggling to cope with what's on its plate at the moment, and I, I just don't see necessarily it all going to kind of Get easy, you know, Brexit's going to become going to be something that will disrupt the Westminster system. I think for a long time. So you've got that going on over there, but I do think there are now discernible green shoots of a different political system emerging here. We, we mustn't overclaim because it is early days, but I think you get the feeling, the beginnings of there is some a better way of doing things, 
when you've got policy out of there and more in the hands of people here. And I think it does need nurturing, it does need watering, it does need everybody to sort of kind of recognise the limitations of it at the moment. And But I, I hope that's how people people feel, that something positive is emerging as in response to some of the, 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 the negativity that we're seeing in politics at a national level. So thank you, June. Thank you for your, your time. You're welcome. Thank, thank you, you for you, your, your, your honest answers. No problem. And uh, as I say, you, I think we'll be coming again in another six months' time or whenever we are up to at that point in time. Look forward to it. And, thank uh, you. And your, your comments, as I say, are always welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Can we now go back to the minutes? So just to approve those from the, 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 the last but one meeting. As you know, the, the previous meeting was in court. So because of the... Um, the regulation, there weren't any minutes. So these are now the minutes of the meeting held on Friday, the 13th of September. Any comments or can we just approve them? Move those, Chair. Okay, we can approve those in. So um, we're now on to the uh, GM Local Enterprise Partnership, and we've got the uh, Chief Executive of the, sorry, the Chair sorry, of, of the LEP, Mike Blackford, here to um, give a presentation and answer questions. Brilliant. With your indulgence, Chair. I think I, should sit up there I think you should do, actually. <laughs> Afternoon, everybody. So I have not got a presentation and 150 slides. Um, so I'm just going to talk the document you have in your pack. Right. Um, make a few salient points, that kind of update from the last time I was sitting in front of you, uh, things that have changed very briefly on those, and then move very quickly into the local industrial strategy and some of the innovation things that we're going in there. Uh, uh, but most of the detail uh, is in the pack that you've got in front of you. Uh, so a quick update. Uh, so last time I was here, uh, we, we were going through what was called the National LEP Review, which government implemented through um, various reports that had gone on. Um, three things happened in there, amongst many others, um, uh, that all boards in the UK, in, in England rather, had to go to gender diversity of a third and two thirds, third female, two, two thirds female, uh, by 2021, was it, or 2020, Simon? 2021. 2021. Uh, just a report that um, from a Manchester point of view, we are seven, six, six, five, depending on which way you look at it, uh, male, female. And, and hit that number um, uh, and more than exceed the government's targets anyway. Um, we have an odd number board. We want to get to gender parity. We have an odd number board at the moment. Um, so we are looking at ways of getting to a, an even number board, although members of the board prefer to have an odd number board, although we've never had a vote in our lives. So um, we will get there and get gender parity as well. Uh, we, uh, all boards had to have a gender um, uh, diversity champion, uh, and we already had one, uh, which is uh, Van der Murray. Uh, and Van has been our, our diversity champion for that. And then we had to, all, all LEPs had to agree that there were no overlapping boundaries. And of course, from a greater Manchester point of view, we've not had an overlapping boundary. There are still some LEPs where the local authorities sit in some cases, in one case, three LEP areas. And it causes consternation from a government point of view about allocation of funding and how you make decisions about that funding. Um, so there's three things that came out of the, um, the LEP review, and so we kind of tick every single box that came through there um, without being kind of blasé about it. We, we were fine on all those three things. Um, also, since the last time I was here, we've had our biannual LEP review of all the members of, of our board, uh, where every person has the ability to either step down or be asked to step down, uh, and we constantly review the board. Um, and we had um, two people who uh, showed willingness to step away from the board, um, from a, uh, one from an illness point of view and one from a timeout point of view. They wanted to move on to, to, to different things from their career point of view, so couldn't give the time. Uh, we had some exceptional candidates came forward, um, uh, the majority of which we want to keep in contact with, and we're going to ask them to join some sub-boards, uh, but we appointed two more members, Chris Oglesby, uh, and uh, Amanda Holfer from GE Life Sciences. So two amazing candidates who came forward, and we've got those two on the board now. Um, uh, and the, the details of all the members are in the pack. So let's move on to the, um, the local industrial strategy, uh, which is the main part in innovation uh, in, in your pack. Uh, just a, a reminder that not necessarily a reminder is needed, but let me remind anyway that 
The local industrial strategy is not a separated part of the Greater Manchester strategy. It is a subset, uh, one of the directional activities within the Greater Manchester strategy. All the things you heard about from Andy before, the Liz sits underneath the Greater Manchester strategy. Um, and, and that's kind of important to say, because when we look at local industrial strategy in other parts of the country, they are being developed in isolation from their own strategies, um, which we don't think um, makes any sense whatsoever. Um, so we did the usual thing in Greater Manchester when we're doing the local industrial strategy of having some independent analysis of our economy um, from some independent organization, independent people. So some world leading economists came and did a prosperity review of Greater Manchester's economy. Uh, and that was a report to Manchester, similar to the one we did 10 years ago in the Manchester Independent Economic Review. So it was a refresh of that, but it was particularly looking at prosperity and looking at every part of Greater Manchester. And of course, when you get an independent review, um, you have to accept it, which is brave in itself to do one, um, but actually means you've got to actually address the challenges that are coming up with it, because you don't know what they're going to come up with. Um, and it's something that Manchester always prided itself on, that we will get independent analysis first, rather than just tell everybody that we're brilliant at every single thing that we do. Um, so he came up with some, some interesting ideas. It involved um, hundreds and hundreds of interviews and roundtables and seminars and events to get uh, an online activity as well to get people to contribute, both individuals uh, and businesses to contribute to what that strategy should look like, what the challenges were, etc. Um, but what I want to do, with, uh, so, so and therefore he also highlighted what were the good things that we're doing and what things where we find challenges. Um, it was then a, a, a series of protracted negotiation with government, uh, because all local industrial strategy have to be in agreement with government about what you will do uh, to drive forward. Um, so that independent prosperity review, uh, along with what the officers brought forward along, across the whole of Greater Manchester, from all your authorities involved in this, uh, came up with some areas of, of outstanding potential attributes that Manchester has um, that could lead to being significant on a world stage. So we wanted to set the bar extremely high for those areas. And what were those few things that we are brilliant at or have the potential to be brilliant at building our research capability that if we turn it into commercialization, we could uh, lead the world uh, uh, or be up there in, in world leading status from a commercialization point of view of uh, some of our sectors. Dropping it right the way down the stack to from world leading right the way through to what are the things we need to do around, and you've already had that conversation around priority three and priority four, around salaries, wages. How do we look at um, involving businesses in that conversation around um, uh, uh, kind of low wages? Are they good enough? Should we not be challenging businesses to do more and better? So right the way through the, the whole thing. Um, so the pack will then talk about... Um, what those areas were that we were uh, potentially outstanding at building our great re um, research and development. So it was around um, health uh, innovation, around life sciences and manufacturing, around digital and creative, uh, and uh, focus on those particular areas in the media. Um, everything in the, in the evidence shows us that we have the potential to be uh, world leading in these things. Um, a lot of them you'll see are built around university research and academic research, and th that is fantastic. It's harder to get that data out of businesses mm -hmm. to find out what are their deep, dark research that they're doing that they don't want to share, because that is very commercial. But you will find activity in here are already building on some of that university research where they're getting partnerships. So you know, we'll call out one straight away, the Kyogen uh, activity that's going on in Greater Manchester, building on the research around uh, personalized medicine and activity around that kind of personalized activity uh, around um, uh, interventions on life sciences and, and um, precision medicine. Um, so we're already building up now an area where we can build research into commercialization very quickly. So if you start going through the report, um, I would say that the report that came out when we launched it in June, uh, and we were fortunate that there was a Secretary of State at the time who really supported us trying to get the, the report launched before various um, silliness started happening in government in the kind of July area, uh, and it was not going to get launched. We'd already had the West Midlands launch. Uh, and uh, Secretary of State um, stood on stage with us uh, and launched ours. Uh, if we delayed more than three or four days, it would not be launched today. Um, that is hugely important, um, not in the political sense, but the businesses were expecting a local industrial strategy to be launched. If we hadn't launched it, I think our credibility amongst the local, some of the business organisations, the Chambers of Commerce and their members, would have dropped. Um, 
Secondly, why it's important is as we go into the kind of period of the next few months of slight uncertainty on our trade and investment and activity, what's going on in, in, in our relationships abroad uh, as well as the UK, the ability to get our Greater Manchester strategy and our local industrial strategy, which we've all agreed to be, be the bedrock of what we are going to do for the next few years to get some stability and certainty for people here is really important to the business community in particular and the investor community because we will still be able to say we've got these things, here's the evidence, this is what we're brilliant at, this is what we want to do, and we're off and pushing. Whereas others will be talking in a vacuum type environment where they have not got an agreement or done the independent evidence yet. So that is uh, extremely important. Um, and so therefore, what, what was launched, um, were uh, over uh, almost 200 people in the room when we launched it with only 48 hours notice, I think it was. Uh, uh, so, and the business community, that when they came back to us, were absolutely overwhelmingly in, in favour of what came through uh, from the report point of view. Um, and the reason I mentioned the GMS in, in context of that is that we had to make that clarity of this is not um, overriding the GMS at all. It's an embedded part uh, of the GMS. And that's a message we will keep uh, pushing out there whatsoever. Um, so if you move on into uh, some of the other pages, you'll see a, a shed load of things that have been going on around. Um, uh, our innovation and our uh, investment stuff that's been money has been attracted to uh, Greater Manchester, uh, mainly through our universities again, about uh, our ability to drive uh, things, whether it's ERDF funding or transport funding. There's a series of things in there which you will see where Manchester has been uh, fantastic. So, Mawson Group launching with uh, the University of Salford is some stuff on the R&D and 3D printing stuff, as one example, has been fantastic. Um, right the way through to uh, where we are today. I mentioned Kaijin already. Um, so one thing that comes out uh, at LEP meetings constantly is our, are we strong enough uh, as a region and actually as a UK at commercialising innovation? Uh, and so we put a particular emphasis and focus on can we commercialise innovation? It's great having research, great being at the top of the league tables of research, but how many of those are we quick enough at taking that research through into products, into services that benefit people, benefit organisations, benefit places, and turn into money as well. Uh, and we don't think we are as quick as some parts of the other world, partly restricted by uh, governance arrangements and within the country, partly restricted by law. Uh, in some parts of the, of the world, they don't have the same kind of uh, organisational um, regulations that we have. Um, but we wanted to commercialise that more quickly. I, sh I should have said, by the way, that every part of the local industrial strategy implementation plan will now be owned by a member of the LEP board and an officer. Um, so the LEP board will know, are not going to be sitting there just uh, around the table once every two months uh, having a look at it. They're actively going to be involved in this. And so we've got people like Nancy Rothwell who are looking at the commercialisation activity around how do we commercialise uh, research and innovation. And we also want to tell our stories about where we're doing that already, like the Kaijen story, the Mawson story, uh, and one or two others uh, as well. Um, so if you move on to some of the, uh, the innovation activity we've already got, which I outlined on page um, 7, 8, and 9, um, you'll see there where we've tried to give some examples um, of some areas where we're already actively working on that innovation, that commercialisation activity. Um, I think it's probably about 11 years, 12 years or so since graphene first got mentioned in rooms like this and it became part of our, our um, terms and conditions of employment. Now I had to mention graphene at every single meeting we ever went to uh, outside of Manchester. Um, so it, it seems like it's taken a long time to move from that research innovation and, and finding of graphene into real products. And it has. Um, however, in between that, I think what the university and the city have been doing, city, city being Greater Manchester, the city region, have been doing, is making sure that the infrastructure is in place to ensure that we can uh, de develop and commercialise activity and innovation. So things like the GEEK, the Graphene Engineering Institute, uh, 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 has been built and Graphene City has now been the foundation for Graphene City. So, so when we start going onto a world stage, we have some bedrock of places where business can come, set up, get access to that research, get access to um, uh, like-minded people and develop real product and services. And you'll now find, if you go around the geek, um, some 20 or 30 businesses sitting there who will show you and demonstrate to you products uh, from training shoes to cars to aircraft wings to water purification systems that graphene based here in Manchester is now developing into products and services and funding to help them um, develop those products and services uh, and realize them in Manchester. Um, the bit that the mayor was mentioning before uh, we think about the whole of Greater Manchester is not when they start developing their businesses and come out of the geek 
we want to retain them in Manchester somewhere. And where's the best place for them? It's not always going to be along the road uh, down in uh, Oxford, the Oxford Road corridor somewhere. It could be in Bury, it could be in Bolton, it could be in Trafford, Thameside, Stockport. We've got to work on where is the best place for these things to be housed. And that will be around an ecosystem of, of uh, like-minded individuals, around access to talent, and be around access to markets for them as well. So I think as a, the 10 boroughs and districts need to be thinking about how do they put their... How do we work all together to put the best opportunities forward for those organisations to come out of the geek and go elsewhere uh, into the city as they come through? Um, the other one I'll mention is, because uh, uh, it was driven by one of my board members, is the Made Smarter initiative. And we talked a little bit before with the Mayor, you talked about, a bit about talent and skills. Um, so the Made Smarter initiative is, is one of those where the government was looking at uh, and asked uh, Jürgen Meyer to do a, um, an in-depth analysis of digitization of our small businesses in the manufacturing area. Um, so this is all around Industry 4.0. So forgive me, um, Industrial Revolution about um, uh, power was about Industry 1. And then you moved into Industry about Electricity, and Industry 3 is about the, um, um, the silicon chip. Industry 4 is about digitization of events, uh, manufacturing, uh, precision activity around uh, organizations. And our businesses in the UK missed out on Industry 3. We didn't capitalise on silicon at all. It was mainly done in the States. So we want to be at the front of Industry 4.0. And so how do we do that? Uh, Jürgen Meyer developed this digitisation idea uh, of and convinced government to give him £20 million to invest in businesses in the northwest of England. Uh, and most of them are coming at the moment from Manchester and Lancashire. Um, so they can put new... Uh, manufacturing tools and techniques into their older based industries to modernize them as well as develop their skills process and for people um, to manufacture those things such that they can be more productive and um, develop and not uh, fall under the wayside which uh, many businesses will do and Jürgen's driven that uh, and you'll see in under uh, items 5, 7 and 5, 8 uh, some of the numbers that are coming through there uh, for organizations uh, over the, uh, the um, next few years Alongside that, the growth company has been doing something around scale-ups. Uh, so how do we get our smaller business to be able to scale up? And we're linking those two programs together um, because sometimes uh, you need digitization in order to scale up as well. Uh, there's a lot there in, in the 5.9 and 5.10 around carbon neutrality. And so things that we're doing around innovation, uh, around getting different fuel cells and different uh, energy houses within Salford to, to make sure that we are, from an innovation point of view, creating the ideas and new products and services for our business to be able to um, uh, adapt in the decarbonisation activity. Uh, and, and the final one I mentioned was, because uh, now Phil's in the room, is around the, the work that Phil and team have been doing around cyber uh, in particular, to make sure that Manchester, uh, you'll, you'll notice in, in the report and your general awareness that Manchester's growing importance in the area of cyber security is significant. Uh, yeah, fundamentally uh, um, uh, backed by GCHQ moving, significant number of people to here, uh, but actually what Phil and team have been doing, now guided with Elise in there as well, is developing things like the Cyber Foundry. So it's great being notified that you've got GCHQ come here, but how are we going to ensure we capitalise on that? So developing things like the Cyber Foundry um, and the Cyber Innovation Centre to make sure that businesses understand what the cyber threat is going to be. Um, and it might sound a bit um, obvious that, but many businesses still do not think about cyber as a significant threat, nor do they think about cyber as being a challenge to their skills, activity they're doing, um, and they think cyber's for banks uh, to think about as opposed to their small business. Anybody who's online, anybody who uses a mobile phone, anybody who uses technology in any shape or form has to have cyber at the heart of what they do. And that's what Phil and the team have been driving through um, the Cyber Foundry and Cyber Innovation Centre, which puts, again, Manchester right at the, um, the top of it, uh, of the agenda. So finally, i just say, leaving that kind of final thought, which I start off right at the very start, is this gives us the foundation for more growth over the next few years um, and more confidence and sustainable growth that we can have um, based on this, uh, the information that we've got, the coming together of all the, um, uh, the data and analysis to say we've got a strategy um, because it is going to be rocky, I think, over the next um, few years. Final, final part of that is that we've also been sharing that with other parts of the north of England because there's many things that we can do, but there's many things that we can do together. So uh, we've been working with the other LEPs um, in the north of England, so called the NP11 and the Convention of the North that Andy and team have been driving to make sure that we are not isolating ourselves uh, and saying that Manchester can do it all, absolutely collaborating with neighbouring authorities, neighbouring LEPs, 
uh, and others around the country. So, Chair, I'll, I'll leave it at that and uh, throw it open for anybody who's got any questions. Before I throw it to questions again, just, just two observations, actually. <coughs> Number one, you're absolutely spot on about, about cyber threats. And um, it concerns me, because I, I used to be an auditor in, in, in my recent past, and I was chair of audit committees. And it, this should be on the agenda of every big company, on every medium size, and even every small company. Mm -hmm. It is a massive, massive threat to so many organisations. But the other thing I'm particularly pleased about is, is the recogni recognition that we're not as good as we, we should be, getting better you know, at commercialisation of innovation. Because this country has always been brilliant at innovation and never particularly good at translating that into commercial developments. And that was the same when I was doing research in chemistry almost 50 years ago. So I really do welcome you know, these observations you're making. Because this area of, 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 of the, the, the country, Greater Manchester, has got a lot of great you know, science here. And, you know, but it's, it's all very well having the research. You've got to have the commercial development as well to actually create jobs and to increase pro you know, prosperity in the region. So I welcome those observations. So questions. Uh, Susan first, and, and then it's Mary. Thank you. I need to get a feel from you about just two things. Uh, the first is um, that, yes, there's, there's quite a lot in here that's uh, so exciting on science and, and research and development. And um, you've told us, actually, that a lot of it is university-based. Some of it reads that it's university-linked. Uh, so it crossed my mind uh, to ask you whether uh, you feel that uh, there's any need whatsoever for something uh, like a science leadership base of any kind. I don't necessarily mean um, what we know of, you know, how to be a sort of a leader in the academic sense, because, uh, you know, we have professors, we, we have... I understand that, I think, what leadership in the academic sense is, but I suppose I'm thinking... Uh, you know, there's quite a lot of different sort of projects and um, activities listed here. And I thought, is the facade, if I can call them organisations, is there anything in Greater Manchester where you would, or you and the LEP, would feel that there'd need to be something that constitutes what you might call a science leadership base? So that would be about, uh, if you like, the knowledge base on what science leadership is for, say, an organisation or a group of individuals. Now, the other question is, a, well, no, it's, it's quite different, actually. The other sense I got as I read it was, I thought, mm, this, this is pretty good for me, that uh, I did some science for a while. You know, in cancer services, I learnt a lot about subjects like immunology and molecular biology. So, you know, I'm lucky enough that I, I actually have a fairly good grounding in science myself, and here I am as an elected member. So that's OK. I don't think I'm ever going to get massively thrown by science. Um, but I thought... Do you know what? I mean, it really is a standout issue in Greater Manchester, the, the, the paper that you've given us that contains so much science. And I thought, but it feels like there's a mismatch around politics because you want political support and surely our elected members and perhaps members of parliament, if they don't mind me mentioning, members of parliament today. And I just wonder whether, uh, and it's probably for others, a, a more senior, perhaps the GMCA, d d is, is it going to... Are we going to come to a point where we sort of think, perhaps we need to have a look at how we can ensure that elected members, our political individuals, are a bit more abreast of science because it's coming now to be such a, a matter that's at the heart of all the achievements that we want to make in this city region across jobs and so on? <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll come to the second one in a minute. Um, so, so, so on the first one, um, uh, there's always room for more, but, but let me talk about two things in that science leadership management. So, so the university in particular, um, uh, at a vice chancellor and a head of innovation level get together now on a regular basis to share innovation. So, so when you think like, look at health innovation, um, particularly at the University of Manchester, MMU and Salford, do very different things in that area, but collectively their innovation leads and bleeds one to the other. And so they, are, um, uh, for, they have formed different groups where they've got um, science innovation technicians coming together to share more. Um, but there's obviously there's always more that you can do, but people then 
quite understandably protect their research and development at certain points. So, so there's a timing issue for that. But the general activity of leadership and management we've pulled out of the Liz, the local industrial strategy, as a key priority area. That I think it's Nancy Rothwell, Simon, that's leading on that one for us. So, so Nancy Rothwell, Vice Chancellor of the um, University of Manchester, is going to lead on general leadership management because it's not just the university, it's, it's across the piece. Uh, and when you think about, uh, and the reason it, it's important is when you think about growing businesses, one of the things that's holding us back to grow our businesses is actually good leadership and management. Um, that they don't know how to let go, how to grow, how to innovate, how to bring, in, uh, bring um, investment into it, how to write a good business case in some cases. So we're looking then at how we use general leadership and management uh, as a set of programs to help stimulate and grow the economy as well. Um, to answer your second one, it's far be it for me to ever say that MPs and councillors need more awareness on science and technology. Um, that's for you. Um, but I think generally, we, you know, it, it, people, I, mean, I was sparked, I mean, I'm not a scientist, but I was genuinely sparked when I first heard about graphene because the story of graphene grabbed me. Um, but I, I then lost it for a few years. And it's only now when I see real products coming out that I can see that that is turned into something that, I, that as, a, as, a, as a person, I can see what a training shoe looks like, why graphene is really important. But the conceptualization of that up to that point just lost me. I could do the, the interesting bit at the start, but it's the product bit that I want to see. But I think we need to tell our stories better. Um, genuinely, we need to tell our stories better about that translation of one to the other. Um, when we get into the kind of precision medicine, it's when Kaijen start explaining what precision, precision medicine really means, I get really excited, but then there's going to be a gap and a lag for me until it comes into real stuff that they're going to do in hospitals with patients. But if you ever wanted training courses, I'm sure we could all put on training courses and, uh, and, and just general awareness uh, about what's required and what's known about in it. Um, but I think, I think, genuinely, I think there's, um, if we pick on those big things that are going to make Manchester uh, on a world-leading stage, Knowing things about those stories is, is really important for all of us to be able to say what they are and what they mean, even if we just point to one thing. It was only just to pick up on the first of those items, and as Mike says, there's always room for improvement. We do now have a, a GM Innovation Board, which gets together all the, uh, the kind of universities, it gets together the kind of business community, and as well as some of the, uh, the kind of um, people, people like uh, Darsbury Science Park and, and um, Alderley, Alderley Park as well, coming together to try and debate some of these issues about in innovation, how we drive innovation faster within the uh, greater Manchester economy. In paragraph 2.13, you reference um, the development of an annual uh, delivery plan. Um, and I wondered why you felt there was a need for the development of such a plan um, and how you determined what was going to be included within that particular plan. Um, so, so, so as a good business person, I would say any, any strategy needs to have a plan to, for delivery. In the same way that you discussed with, with Andy earlier on, about the, and, and, sorry, and therefore a delivery plan needs to be simplified so anybody can understand it. I think what the team have developed in the Greater Manchester strategy in terms of the temporality areas, the development of those um, plans for delivery, and the ease at which I can now look at the GMS and, and see at a glance whether it's good, bad or indifferent, and then dive into the bits as you did with the medium pay, um, that you can see where and where you want to, to home in on it was really important. And the, I, th I think it's fair to say, Simon will correct me if I'm wrong, but it's fair to say that it was the, the, one of the things that the LET did about the GMS said that our implementation plan was not as good as it needed to be. So Simon and crew went away and developed something, and then we said it's a bit too detailed now. Um, and what they've come up with, I think, is a, is a great piece. So, so what we've now said is two things. Go away and do the same for the local industrial strategy for the same reasons. And secondly, as I said earlier on, allocate a, a person from the LEP who will own it alongside Simon so that the officers are not isolated or doing things in isolation. Because these people on the LEP have got fantastic knowledge and experience and be able to, to help review, challenge, open, connect, support is really important. Uh, and and the, every LEP member's volunteered to do that. Um, and then we'll share it with all of you uh, and, and all other authority. Your authority will be involved uh, in those delivery mechanisms as well. Um, so it's not in splendid isolation. But without it, how do you measure where you are? Uh, Luke. Uh, thank you, and thanks for your presentation. Um, so as you'll be aware, 
central government likes to change the words it uses, change its structures and mess around every few years regardless of party. Um, ten years ago we had RDAs. A few years ago we didn't even talk about industrial strategy and I gather even in the last you know, year we started to talk about it less in the last few months. God knows what's happening. God knows what's going to happen. The question I suppose is to what extent is all of this future-proofed in terms of central government shake-ups and changes to the terms they use and so on. Are we going to just rebadge a local industrial strategy, something else, if they so deem it? Um, so that's the first question, is how, how do we future-proof this, especially delivery plan? Um, the second one is, like, looks like a great board of people and no disrespect to them, but they do seem to be sort of quite small employment areas of the economy that are represented there, and that's very important for the reasons you've outlined. Um, but is, is, it, is anyone from the retail sector, hospitality sector, how, how do you engage with those sectors which are big employers in the city region? And from what we know, um, that's where the productivity benefit will actually come from, is that everyday economy, that sort of, the, the economy in which, in which two thirds at least of the city region is employed. How, how, is that, how are those sectors catered for? How are they represented? How are they engaged with? And related to that, there are leps in other parts of the country where trade unions are involved, of course. Um, was that something that you considered? What are the, how, how do you engage with trade unions? Because from, again, what most of us know here, that's how you make good economic policy is with workers alongside businesses and the public sector taking things forward together. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, so, so how you future-proof things is, is, is well, so, so, so uh, by, by doing the independent analysis, by getting the 10 authorities connected and working together as you do, by involving the business community and the third sector in producing a plan, tells everybody that you are coherent in what you develop. The art of the uh, thing, what I've seen Manchester do, and in my involvement in Manchester over the last 20 years in, in helping and supporting this, is our ability to adapt and adopt whatever colour of government comes in has been pretty phenomenal, actually. Um, and therefore, because the, the compelling evidence is still the same. It doesn't matter what they, how they change the name, the compelling evidence you produce is still the same. Um, and our co compelling evidence is coherent. If we were doing something that was misaligning things and making it up as we went along, I, I think others, others, a new form of government, a new arrangement would be um, just thrown at us and we, we get thrown out. So, so being coherent is, uh, and having the evidence is, is worthwhile. And, and I think the other thing I would say is that um, by having that constant communication and dialogue with both officers and others down in Whitehall is really important by engaging yourselves and our local MPs in those conversations, keeping abreast of things. So we, we all say, what, the one thing people talk about outside of Manchester is when, when they come and visit is, who wrote that single brief for all those people I ever spoke to? And of course, it was never a single brief, but we are, you know, we are coherent in how we say things and what we do. And that goes down really well elsewhere. Um, so, so I think I've seen it so often in the, in the past 10, 15 years, new governments come in, new ideas get formed, and they often will come to Manchester privately for ideas and challenge and, and thought, and, and people like Eamon and Simon and others before them, as well as the politicians, are really good at, without saying we, we know best in Manchester, saying this is what works for us. Look at the coherence, the, in, the integration, the connections. So, so I'm, less wor I'm always worried about change. Um, but I'm, I'm less worried about Manchester's ability to adapt uh, to that change. Um, on your second point of... So I've seen some other left, by the way, with 40 people around the table. So, partly to your point, they've tried to include every single organisation possible on their board. Um, and they don't get anything done. So what, the way we've tried to do it is by identifying the critical sectors that we need for economic growth uh, and for inclusive growth that we've got as well as those that are supportive sector, like professional services, developer community, and investor community that will help those. Um, but, but let's not forget the other 100 people that we've got sitting on the sub-board activity, whether it's on the digital board that, that Phil runs, or the skills and, and working board, or the health innovation board, or our own innovation board, that also bring those things, where trade unions do sit on the skills, uh, and, and skills and working board. Um, but it was about... Uh, we wanted people to be able, on the board to be able to represent those growing industrial sectors that we've got today. That's not to say it's going to be right in the next couple of years. So we've, if you look at our history of the lab, we've changed. We've had retail on the board, and now we've moved on to something else. Otherwise, you don't adapt and change. But we've kept that retail connection. Classic example, um, we used to have Arup on the board, or somebody from Arup. Uh, four years into the, being a lab, um, he left, Roger Milburn left, and we asked him to chair the infrastructure board for us. 
and he's now driven that infrastructure ball. So we kind of kept it. And if we don't, then, then we're just not adaptable again ourselves. So we, we try to involve it as much as possible um, and adapt and change and use that skills elsewhere. So we are addressing retail hospitality um, through other means, um, and we're not, certainly not ignoring it. Uh, I'm conscious of time. There are two hands that have gone up already. But can you keep your question short as possible, please? And that's George and then Charles. Uh, thank you, Chair. So I'll keep it brief. Um, so um, how will uh, the potential loss of ERDF affect some of the um, various uh, different um, different um, uh, things that you've mentioned here uh, in part five? or Because it comes up a lot, that funding. So, so, so I'm going to look to Simon to correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding of the current EODF pots that we're talking about here is that though that money is secure because we're in delivery phase of that money, but we have targets and dates to hit along the way. Um, what we are more concerned about is the substitution effect of that. So what, so what will the, the Share Prosperity Fund look like as and when it comes out, if it ever comes out, uh, and therefore can we influence the shape of that going forward such that one could dovetail the other. I think whichever government gets in, if you don't, that ERDF is such having a positive impact, uh, certainly in, in England, having a positive impact, to take away those hundreds and you know, billions of pounds would leave a gaping hole. And actually, it's the communities outside of London and the South East which would be more, most impacted uh, right way across uh, England. So we are pushing very hard, uh, both as a LEP community, but as a LEP in Manchester and the combined authorities saying that Share Prosperity Fund needs to be thought clearly about uh, and it is, has to, it, it is not necessarily as purely substitutional because the world evolves, but about how do we, how do we make sure it's, it's the right form of funding in the right phrase. That, uh, and we're trying to get away from, I think, a typical Manchester again, we're saying ERDF doesn't always work. In, it's, it's, it comes with real strings attached to it and such restrictions in some cases that it doesn't allow us to do the things that we really wanted to do. And so, so we're trying to ask them for funding in a way that is, allows us some reasonable expansive ideas and challenge, because Manchester is different to Mevergissi and Middlesbrough. So, so how do we do some kind of localization? Um, and, and back to the point, but this place in Greater Manchester is more trusted than anywhere else to take that and implement it and do it with real value. Um, and, and it's a place, kind of to Luke's point, in a way based on action rather than rhetoric. Charles. Um, yeah, thanks. It's we, it's been mentioned by yourself, the mayor and members, about how we share this good news out with the districts. And I was just looking at the Made Smarter thing, which is two thirds way through its the pilot. Um, and we talk about contacting 3,000 SMEs and, and adding to the GVA by 150 million. Is it possible that if we could look at the geography of where we've touched these 3,000 or how many we have SMEs and how much has been added to GVA but breaking down into districts and then it'll give us a focus on do we need to do more to spread this good story out or is it working? That's all. I think it's a really good idea uh, and the team are working on some of that anyway um, so um, I, th I think Simon needs, we'll ask Simon to go away and do a bit of a report on the Made Smart about where it is, what we've been doing, the detail of it, and, and also the timelines, because the productivity change will lag the investment, um, partly because you sometimes will have to recruit or invest in new, new technologies um, in order to, to implement whatever it is in their manufacturing area. Um, I think the second part, uh, uh, if I add to that, um, because this is a short-term program, um, I think what we have to look at then is what have been the positive and negative aspects of the Made Smarter. And, and like anything else, we, it should be a test. And if everything comes out beautiful, then we're either brilliant uh, or we're, we're frigging the figures somewhere. Uh, there are some things that will not work, I would think, uh, I would suggest. Um, but we, we cannot stop it. Once, once this gets on the bandwagon, um, digitization is going to continue forever. Uh, so we've got to find ways, and it might be through the Shared Prosperity Fund or other funding arrangements that we need to think about how do we, if this works in what way, how do we continue to support businesses thereafter uh, in order to grow? But I think we should, there has been a report, Simon, done on Made Smarter. Um, I think we just need to share that um, more widely if possible. So Richard Jeffrey, Richard Jeffrey produced yeah. some information on that at the last time he was here when we had the, uh, the growth company here, but I can certainly uh, dig that information out and provide it to you. Okay. Yes, Simon mentioned that to me. So we, are, we have run out of time, unfortunately. 
Mike, that was great, actually. That, that there's clearly a lot of positive things happening you know, with the LEP in Greater Manchester. And I am also aware that other LEPs perhaps are not as quite as successful as our LEP. I know you can't. But um, there were some great things there, and uh, we wish you well you know, going forward. Thank you. It's great. Thank thanks. thanks a lot. Yes, Chair, I did. Thank you. Um, would you prefer if we moved and sat at the front? Would that be helpful? Okay, I think we can move and sit there. So, thank you. It, it, yeah, it's going to be a bit unfair on you, but, but as we are you know, running over time, if you can keep the presentation as short as possible, I will. So, we, so we have more time for questions. I will assume that you have read the report. I think you're absolutely right. Um, <laughs> and you know hopefully works. you will have been able to actually um, really take the time to see that this digital, the new digital strategy in its digital format. Um, so the purpose of this was um, a refresh of our digital strategy. Um, and we needed to take a look at what we'd had in the past and ensure that we are still fit for purpose uh, going forward. And part of this uh, Greater Manchester Digital Blueprint now is a piece, it's a piece of work that we have done um, in collaboration across Greater Manchester. And by that, I don't just mean um, it is a piece of work the Combined Authority has done. It is a piece of work the Combined Authority has done with um, the uh, councils that make up Greater Manchester, but also the businesses involved within this sector, uh, which is wide and, and, and varied, um, and the voluntary sector as well, um, to make sure that what we have is something that is uh, robust, based on evidence that is co-designed, and that everybody feels that they can get behind. Um, and I think that's, that's really important. So we've heard, actually, I have to congratulate the chair for stacking the agenda the way he did because to have us come after your lab um, piece and the piece about the GMS, I think is, is, is really, really smart because this fits in and dovetails in with what, was, what, what you've all been talking about so far today and takes that digital ecosystem that we have that is really budding now. Like, we have shoots of incredibly exciting things taking place in Greater Manchester, um, but it's making sure, as we were said before, that we can take full advantage of what that's going to be able to give us. So whilst we have these shoots, maybe creative stuff going on, or we've got, like, all the cyber stuff that was mentioned um, taking place, loads of things that we know about that, that we are connected in what we do, um, that different elements are connected together, both in terms of not just cyber working in isolation from creative stuff, but also public sector, private sector, and the voluntary sector all working in a way to ensure that we are delivering for the people of Greater Manchester and that that is the heart of what, we're, what, what the ambition is. Um, I think um, what um, hopefully you'll have seen is that this definitely showcases Greater Manchester does digital differently. Um, we're really clear that digital and the pace of change is huge. We've spoken about change already today um, and that things do not stay static. Um, it is for this reason that you'll hopefully have noticed that this strategy is in its draft form because the, we cannot, I don't feel in our hearts of hearts that you can genuinely say that you have taken feedback, that you have worked with everybody if we have not brought it to scrutiny and heard what you've had to say first. Um, so before we've got the final say off on this strategy, I'm really, really keen to hear what your thoughts are about what you've seen through this strategy. Um, 
and you know so we can we can we can we can think about that and, and see how we can best reflect that as well in what we're doing but please bear in mind that this is going to always be a working document to a certain extent we anticipate it to be something that is agile something that is iterative and something that will be able to change because Digital is changing so, so fast. Things are happening at pace that there is no point setting something now and thinking that that potentially is going to be exactly relevant in its exact way it is now in a few years' time. It just isn't. So we need to make sure we have something that is dynamic. And then finally, I just wanted to touch on the fact that um, last night I was, op I was at the opening event uh, for the launch of the, digital, the new Digital Resilience Centre um, for uh, the... Uh, it, it, that's in great, in, for Greater Manchester, based in Manchester. And um, cyber, you've mentioned, you've heard speak about a lot tonight, uh, today. It is going to be huge. It is a hugely exciting piece of work. We are doing things in Greater Manchester where others are not doing it. And what is so great about Greater Manchester, and this is a real kind of example of, uh, what, uh, of how the digital can be uh, here in Greater Manchester is the way that that's all worked together. So with GM Cyber, that entire digital security ecosystem, we have over 30 organisations spanning central government departments, GCHQ, four universities, the local authorities, business and company, you know, business, business networks, health organisations, startups, accelerators. That's just in that one cyber element. So I just think that was, and, and last night we saw people from across that sector come together in what is going to be really places on the map uh, nationally in what we're going to, in what we're doing within that cyber sector. Um, did you want to add anything? Well, um, if I could actually just add a couple of things. I think there's a, a little bit of what's different from the previous strategy, uh, which was signed off by the Command Authority back in February 2018. As Elisa said, the, the, a huge amount has um, happened in this space and continues to happen in this space since then. But I think there's been a reflection in this work that that original piece didn't focus on people sufficiently. So the, hence the first theme around empowering people is, is, is really critical and has come through very strongly, um, particularly as well from the Independent Prosperity Review earlier this year, the focus on enabling all businesses and not just the high-tech you know, stars of the future. Um, which, which links in with the local industrial strategy, the foundational economy review, and, and, and other work similarly that, that's happening. Um, there's a stronger focus on data within some of this. And, uh, and as Elisa said, there's a really strong focus on how we collaborate as an ecosystem in Greater Manchester, which is something we do very u almost uniquely, actually. And perhaps in, we don't necessarily see it because we live in Greater Manchester and we work in this way. But actually, some of the statistics and evidence shows that it's, it's, we're, we're quite unique, actually. Yeah, in terms of density of meetups and so on for, for, for city regions that are, that are like ours. So it's a, it's a phenomenally exciting time. Uh, Lisa and I were both speaking at a Supercharging the Digital Economy event this Wednesday uh, for the North, and the conversation and dialogue, very similar to last night's, uh, was, in, was incredibly exciting. But I think critically we have to make sure that's an opportunity for everyone in Greater Manchester, wherever you are in Greater Manchester, and for all ages in Greater Manchester, because increasingly we, we recognise that careers for life are not necessarily going to be the norm, or indeed are probably well past now. So how do we help people career switch, uh, find new careers, retrain later in life? Um, we believe we will need somewhere in the order of, a th well, we think there'll be somewhere in the order of 50,000 new creative digital and tech roles created in Greater Manchester over the next 10 years. That is a that's a huge opportunity. These are high-value roles and opportunities. We want them to come here, but we want to grow our own, and we want to make sure there's opportunities for people across the city region. Questions? Susan, then Ray. Uh, uh, thanks so much. Um, with you, uh, with you uh, talking now about the, the focus more on people, you know, some of the change that's gone on with, with a new leader now on, on digital, and also uh, another change, of course, was a little bit less excess focus on the tech businesses and more on all businesses, the, the data focus and so on. Um, does that mean if you want to have digital summits, which you had that were very effective in the past, uh, does it mean you 
your sort of your work plan, your action plan, is it going to involve those summits going forward? Uh, and are they going to be different if you've now, you know, changed the way that you're uh, prioritising the work and the thing, things you focus on? Um, yes, we're going to have the summits. Um, we had one uh, a few months ago, uh, Distractions, um, which had a massive, you know, really well attended with a vast array of organisations um, that was um, one of the, the, the purpose being actually this strategy, to talk about this strategy. And we had everybody there from like little sole trader who is kind of working themselves on something, um, new kind of idea that they're getting on, all the way up to international organisations that are either seeking to come to Greater Manchester or even or they're not even in the UK yet and they're looking for a place in the UK um, to come and, and, and settle and, and kind of everybody in between which uh, that 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 is what is so exciting about it I think uh, so I would say the ambition is to continue to bring in people together I think it'll be absolutely key because there was a something said uh, earlier here around um, how we communicate how we make sure that we get that out and how we can uh, not just communicate what is happening but communicate where it's not happening or where we want to be able to do stuff and how we can work together and how great a Manchester Combined Authority can be that influencer that helps say actually there's a space here and this is where we need to we need to do something about and whether that is individuals ensuring that we don't leave people behind that those that are not digitally able or not digitally en engaged get those skills and start on that process and if they're not why not and genuinely understanding that and what we need to do about that through to businesses that are not digital businesses so your electrician like and in his van and he goes and you know you can he can come to your house and do jobs at your house he may not be digital he may not have an invoicing system or an accounting system that's maybe done in a cloud or and and where that could have been you know, or, or she could have had, you know, could make the more most out of doing that. So it's really important that we don't leave neither the individuals as in themselves being able to access things digitally, but also as, as, as business people, as people who run businesses, those people as well, they also need to be ensuring that their businesses can remain relevant and viable. And we need to ensure that we've got what we need in place for that. Did, did you want to add anything? If I could have just briefly, it's um, it's a really good question, and the, the, um, but what I was just going to add, perhaps, is that there are there are some huge events already going on in the digital space in Greater Manchester, and actually to try and convene everyone under one banner is is almost impossible now. Health Innovation Manchester in September was enormous. Digitech later this month is pretty big. Yeah. We're looking at a digital festival week in a week in March next year, next year. But we're also going out to schools and, for example, the, through the um, Digital Futures Programme, Go Digital and GM Digital Bridge. So taking that out as well, because you can't expect, you know, you self-select if you just put something on and ask people. You've got to go out to people as well. So, so how we engage with schools and communities and localities and town centres is, is so important. We, and, and the digital inclusion piece is, is massive within that. So... It's a mix, I think. And one of the challenges we've got is, yes, we do want to continue to convene people twice a year with a sort of digital alternate futures um, uh, forum or uh, event, open event. But if you had everyone, it would be like 25,000 people, So, which might be great, actually. That might be where we want to get to. I'm looking at Eamon <laughs> slightly alone. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, right, as well. Fine, good. Question. June. I just wanted to do a little bit more expansion on the next generation of going digital and how that is being monitored and, and performance of that. How long has it been going and what monitoring and evaluation has been done and what lessons have been learnt to move that forward? Thank you. So I'll answer and then I'll... Bring you in. Um, so the, uh, the the skills um, skills is a, it's a huge issue uh, on uh, it's there's two sides to that coin in that 
people need to feel that they have that lifelong learning, that they are relevant, that the confidence that that brings that, yes, even if I don't have this job, I have the skills necessary to find another job. So is it, there's a, it's incumbent on us to ensure that we've got that right. And then on the flip side, if you like, there are businesses and organisations come in and want to come to Greater Manchester or are wanting to grow and expand, and they need to make sure that they've got the right people to do that. Um, so. Uh, the, in terms of digital specifically, um, the, I'm sure Phil will be able to go into the, a lot of the, the, the details, but I think it's important to remember that that is something that we have to look at across all the sectors, not just in digital. So we have skills driven th f through um, uh, Sean Fielding, who leads on skills for us. So there's a crossover between what we're doing here in uh, digital with the, the, with the digital, along with Sean, and how we're together, we'll have to make sure that 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 we hold that to account and drive that further as uh, going forward. But that we do it in a linked up way, that we don't do anything in isolation, but that we're clear on that. Now there are work, there is quite a bit of work going on, not just in terms of specific. There are specific projects, but the the general theme on that is that we ensure that we are engaging early so that we're taking businesses and uh, uh, places of education um, with children and young people to ensure that actually we're uh, inspiring and energising those children to be to come into the STEM subjects because that's where we're going to need them to be getting excited about and wanting to participate in to ensure that we can take them further forward on it. There are a vast amount of work going on on that and it's quite, it's quite detailed. Did you want to pick up on this specific one? If, if I may, I mean, just there's a couple of things, really. Um, I meant to say before, we're, we kept the detail of some of the specific programme delivery plan work that's going on across each of these areas out of it, because otherwise it, would, it, it just got too, too much. Um, uh, but as Elise, uh, Councillor Wilson, saying, we're, we're working on a joint piece between skills and digital to articulate what that space looks like as a whole. There are about 17 initiatives that are happening across Greater Manchester uh, around this, of which Go Digital is just one. Um, uh, digital Futures work, the, the consortium around that, working with schools. The far, so more recently, the Fast Track Digital Workforce Fund, which is a £3 million fund, which we advertised um, or invited applications through in the summer. We've been through that evaluation process. The initial um, set of successful organisations has gone through that, and we'll be going out again for a further set. Um, there are more broad, more, there are broader aspects as well, though. If you look at, for example, um, local growth funding, the, the School of Digital Arts, SODA, at Manchester Met University, thirty million pound investment. So we are making some quite big investments across the city region. The piece we're doing at the middle is really, at the moment, really, is looking at. If we have this 50,000 target over 10 years, what's the delta between what we're currently doing ourselves and, that, and, and what that will generate and what that will deliver? What's critical within this is, is um, the activity, obviously, of academia and schools, but also the private sector. You know, that we're not, we, you know, we collectively need to step up to that challenge. It, it, you know, this, we can't do enough ourselves, the challenge around devolved education and, and, and so on. Um, I think if you, if you're at a, whenever I'm at a digital event, if I get the chance, I ask people to put their hand up to say, where did you learn digital skills? Did you, did you study it? Did you go to the university? Or did you learn on the job? And you tend to find at least two thirds of the room learnt on the job through uh, whichever company they're with. I mean, I've got a degree in biology. I, I learned um, the hard way, I suspect, uh, over a long period of time. But um, that mix is really critical. It, and we have to collectively work towards the, the, the opportunity and the ambition there. Can I just add as well, I think we're starting to see companies as well, digital companies, coming in and specifically uh, with an interest in that space of training and reskilling um, uh, to make sure that actually those skills that they've got, it's specific what they're looking for and it's so relevant that if you go and do a course, by the time you've finished your course, things have changed. So there is a, we're seeing a market now, like a, a space where there's business coming in to try and really try and bring in and make it happen fast and ensure that the skills are relevant. We saw uh, last night at the Cyber Resilience
Learning Centre, there was talk there about, well, you can go to university and do a degree, but by the time you've finished it, it's not relevant to what we're doing. So we're, they're creating, through that Cyber Resilience Centre, how we and make sure that we take those graduates whilst they're, or, or what, those students whilst they're still there and giving them paid opportunities within the Resilience Centre to make sure that the skills are really, really current and they're coming out and they have both that tabletop learning, if you like, but also that practical um, experience and they've come out at the end with something on their CV that says, not only do I have this piece of paper that says I can do this, I, I have actually gained some skills doing it that are relevant to what the, what the system needs from me right now. More questions? I, I've got... Um, because this is a different sort of presentation to what we had previously, I went back to the previous one and just to understand if you like what was in there. And the, the one thing that struck me was that previously there were a number of uh, uh, measures and, and key targets, and particularly around, particularly around what was the the, 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 the key dynamic of the pre, of the previous iteration of this which is growth and productivity to increase GVA you know, per job in the area through digitization. And that's maybe in here implicitly, but it's not in here explicitly. And I'm just wondering if any views have changed on that. And secondly, as a wider issue, and you're absolutely right, it's, it's a dynamic situation here. And, and also, I can understand why you've done the President, this is the way around because it's, it's the sort of thing that in the digital industry people do this sort of thing. But nevertheless, you also need digital as well. And therefore, the other question was, which was a, a similar narrow vein, was are there any other fundamental changes that you've made in the terms of the refresh, to use your phraseology? And, and the last bit of that, I was intrigued that you used the word digital blueprint rather than digital strategy. So um, there are explicit targets, obviously, as well. Um, it, a lot of the feedback we got was from the businesses when we did our distractions and we've interacted both through the LEP and various other ways. A lot of the feedback we got was y y you can't produce like a 500-page document because we feel that actually it needs to be something that we can engage in, that's, that we recognise as well, that we feel as like had that input. And it needs to be... Um, one of the words that came out of the digital of distractions, and I'll share it with you, was it needs to be visually delicious. Because the thing is, we here are really... Um, we're really uh, passionate about what we're doing. We're here because we have a sense of purpose. And we will take these documents because this is what we do. We're elected members. We represent the people. We'll make time to make sure that we understand what's being put in front of us. And we'll read it. Fine. So that's us. But what we're trying to do is actually connecting people. We want people to go, oh, what's this thing? And actually take the time. People who are not like us, who are, you know, really... Uh, committed to what we're doing, but ordinary people whose real life gets in the way of being able to engage in stuff. And I think that was a really important part of the thinking was we need something that people can see and go, do you know what? This is the strategy. This is the blueprint. And the blueprint is we're going to put people at the heart of what we're going to do. We're going to put the people of Greater Manchester at the heart of what we're going to do. And we're going to put the things that matter to them at the heart of what we're going to do. And that, that is in a nutshell, what this what this is. And it is a blueprint. It is a blueprint because we are ahead of the game. In all honesty, Greater Manchester, we are doing really, really exciting things. We, there is absolutely zero reason not to think we will achieve our ambition to be a top five European digital city region. We are going to become a global influencer. That is exactly the plan, and we have every intention to go. And it doesn't matter which bit of that digital economy, that ecosystem I go out and talk to. They're all, they're all ready, they're all fizzing, they're all excited about it, they're all engaged on that same aligned trajectory. 
And that, so that's why I have every confidence that that's going to happen. There are specific measures that I'm happy to share out those details with you. Um, but say, for example, growth and productivity, GVA, GVA per job, to grow GVA per filled job from 40... £41,984 to £44,500 by 2020, the other way, yeah. So there are specifics and I can share those, there's a little list there, I'm not going to read them all because I'm aware of time. We do obviously have all that behind the scenes, but this is about, these are our main priorities and these are the main ways in which we're going to deliver those. This is the project that we're working on at the minute, this is where we've attributed the money, this is what we're working on to deliver those out, those priorities. I understand that in terms of you know, your presentation, let's say presentation of, of the strategy, and as I said before, because of the nature of the industry, this is what they'd want. You know, it, it, it's a very young industry and it's, they don't want rooms and rooms of paper, they want something that's interactive or anything else. And I understand, I get that. I also get your enthusiasm, which is wonderful. But nevertheless, one of the key drivers here, and it, it, it pervades all the way through the Great Manchester strategy, is to increase productivity and GVA. And that's why what I was interested in uh, and I focused on that because that was a detailed, if you like, objective and a, de a detailed measure. But there is no specific mention within the presentation about that. And, that's, and, th and that is the one thing that I would have thought ought to be in there. Because it, it is a major driver, and it's all very well, we've talked about this in the past actually, creating no low value jobs in the, in, in, in the, the, the conurbation of Greater Manchester. What it's all about, you know, it, it's, it's also about creating, if you like, good value jobs. No, no. What, I mean, we talked about before, but science and innovation, and so it's 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 around that as well. And, and that I think, to me, will be an important message to convey in your question, particularly Barry. My what you're saying, it is there in the background, but somehow or other, it's got lost in translation, what I can see. But yeah, and I think that's why I was really keen that we brought it here before we signed everything off and we had something final, because the whole point was that actually we need to make it the best, it needs to be fit for purpose, but not just for, not just for the business, not just for the general public that I would genuinely like to get involved in this, or the schools, or even uh, or, or even as local authorities, but as a combined authority, it's relevant to us that it delivers for us as much as it's delivering for them. So I think it's something I will share with you, but I think it's something we need to go back and think about maybe how we reflect that better in, in, the, in the strategy, in the blueprint that we're, we're working on. Part. The key thing here to me is there's, there's so many m massive opportunities here it's getting young children to engage in the opportunities that can be created you know, by, by this sector. And particularly you know, if we're leading the game. And, so, and, and it, when I was looking up, if you like, one of those, there's some of the brand names in there, you know, whether it be in the public sector, private sector. I thought you've got GCHQ up here. I just, it's, it's, that's, that's a great message. But, 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 it, but, it, is a, but it, it is about, as well, getting you know, the, 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 the people for the future who would more like to have these old skills rather than old blanks like me, who was always, always, always going to be struggling. So it, it's, um, I, just, I just think it's, 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 it's a great thing, what you're doing. I, I like the presentation, but it's just that one area which I just thought that... No, I yeah. take on board your point yeah. about adding that in, but that was, when I said, uh, you know, that visually delicious, and I must as ascribe that that wasn't mine, I didn't come up with it, I've, I've stole that slogan off somebody else, um, so, and uh, her name's Katie, it was her slogan. Um, but that idea of visually delicious is specifically that, because the message doesn't get out there all the time. We need to find something that's going to be actually, people think, oh, what, what is that again? Like, because otherwise we can produce something again, and we know there's amazing stuff going on. There's loads of amazing stuff going on, but it, but we're not getting the message out. You know, did you know GCHQ are moving here, and how much they're moving here, and what that's going to mean for us, or anybody else, or what the work IBM are doing, or Siemens are doing with children and young people through our education system to engage them in STEM subjects. You know, or any. Or, there are loads of things going on. I mean, I just dropped a few names, but that's. That, that, Final thing on you, we're asked to agree that the blueprint should be reviewed annually to reflect the dynamic environment in which it's embedded. Absolutely. Well, I presume the committee would agree. It's absolutely. It is such a dynamic environment. Okay. Many thanks for your presentation. So, we're, 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 I'm sorry we overrun, but we did agree some time ago we, that, we, that we would overrun if, if need be, and I'm trying to keep it as, as least overrun as possible. That's right. English probably isn't. Never mind. Um, the next thing is the Brexit preparation. Anything to say on that, Simon? There is a paper there, but is it really for noting? Just to note, Chair.
Then we've got the, um, the uh, work program. The main thing on the work program is we need to decide whether or not we're having a meeting in December. Um, the GMCA meeting has been cancelled. Um, I've, com I've talked to officers and we are convinced that if we don't have a meeting in December, the items can be, you know, if you like, amalgamated, or they might be slightly longer meetings, like, like today, into the, the, the remaining meetings in the year. Um, I'm conscious of the fact that if it's, if it, if it's you know, we, in the past when it's been in a poor situation, elections, but that was April, we've had meetings, but of course, the time at which people can go campaigning is obviously limited because of the of our of, of the hours of, 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 of lightness, etc. Uh, it's not my decision. It's not the officer's decision. It's your decision if you want it. So, uh, what are your thoughts? Sorry. Could I suggest then, given given, given everything that's happening and and the fact that. It, and we struggle for attendance anyway, and given our previous conversation, that we agree not to have the meeting in December, given the fact that the GMCA aren't meeting either, and that then that work you know, moves on to January, and at least then that will give us more time, and hopefully ensure that we've got a good attendance for January, then we can crack on. That will be my proposal. I'm, I'm happy with the proposal, but I just caution about you wanting to move it all into January because you've got three items in January whereas on February members won't like this because you've actually highlighted for February possible visit to Manchester Airport well, why don't you hold that back a bit and maybe get some I was what well, I wasn't suggesting once people have decided members. about the thing then the if you could leave it to the chair and vice chair with the officers to to reorganize the um the, if you like the schedule for the for the new rest of the, or the new the new the new year the new calendar year, and I suspect you're absolutely right. You're very intuitive that the, a casualty might be a visit to Manchester Airport, which we push back to the next um, municipal year. But I'm but I'm but I'm not making f you know we'll, we'll, early no early conclusions. We're, we're working. working. The other thing we could have, but when it's slightly less critical, in the past we have had a meeting in in, in, in April time, and we were called it last year. And the year before. There'll be snow down the airport. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> Chair, Sorry, can, can I can I also add uh, that I'd like to see something else added to the agenda, please? I'd like another item adding to the agenda, please. Yeah. Is that okay? Can I? Yeah. Right. I'm waiting for you to answer, Chair. That was all. So uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, and it was the adult ed. I'd like to see that, please, come in here. Um, it was something that was raised today. I think it is important if yeah. there's that type of money being spent there, £92 million. I think we need to have a look at it and to see how that's moving forward for around the conurbation. Thank you. Yeah, can I just add, so the, you, you scrutinised the decisions yeah. that we made yeah. about the £92 million and before it was spent. I think we should just think about the time, sorry, before it was allocated, I think we should just think about the timing of that. So we've got some, you know, and I'll work with, with, uh, with the chair on it, uh, just so we've got the data on, on, so we've got some performance data to actually share with you about how it's being used. So, we, you, so you've, yeah. you've scrutinised the decisions yeah. we made, is now scrutinising the, or having a look at the, the impact of those decisions. Yeah. Right, it's just that I'm a new member of this committee, so no, I haven't scrutinised it. Okay, so quite frankly, I would like a briefing on that, of what had been scrutinised previously. So it's a background refresh. But yeah, so that would be great. It's just that somebody said we scrutinised. Yeah. I'm not aware of it, no, no, so it would be what, great what, to actually what, have that information. What Simon is saying is that the actual, the way in which the money was allocated, that was scrutinised. Okay. The money has now been allocated. And what Simon is saying, that in terms of how that's been then utilised, we'll get a feedback of that as a monitoring. So, but I suspect that'll be in... in won't, won't that be available next year, presumably? We, I, I just need to go back and check exactly when it would make sense to bring something back. Yeah, OK. But, 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 but it will come back. But, 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 but not, we can't, obviously, re-scrutinise the original decision. That's been done. No, 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 but yeah. it would be great to have a refresher of what had been scrutinised for me, myself, because I've not been on this scrutiny to have a look at it. So that might be helpful as well. Thank you.